You don't want the truth. You make up your own truth. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the greatest plot twists in movies released since the year 2000. There will be massive spoilers ahead, so consider this your warning. The weapon is their language. They gave it all to us. Do you understand what that means? So we can learn how to plot if we survive. Number 30. Eli is Blind. The Book of Eli. The Book of Eli takes place in a post-apocalyptic future where modern society has crumbled after nuclear war. With civilization deteriorating, a mysterious man named Eli becomes determined to fix things by spreading the word of the Bible. While it's easy to guess that this movie is pretty heavy on religion, viewers might not have guessed that Eli is actually blind. It's impossible! He can't be! It's a twist that not only surprises everyone watching, but also reaffirms that Eli is a pretty special character. With few resources and no ability to see, Eli is guided by his pure faith and devotion to his cause. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Number 29. Sarah is still in the cave. The Descent. When six women plunge into a complex cave, terrifying creatures known as crawlers are quick to find them. <laughs> Protagonist Sarah is eventually able to escape from the cave and get to safety, or so we think. It's soon revealed that she imagined this, as she wakes up back in the confined space, anticipating the terrifying creatures. The Descent is an intense horror film that's filled with moments of gore, betrayal, and all kinds of dread. After enduring hell, we thought Sarah was going to make it out okay, but this movie had other ideas. Talk about a bleak finale. Unless you watch the US ending where she does get out. The Descent Part 2 confirms her survival, but this is still a brutal twist. Number 28. What Curtis Almost Did to Young Edgar Snowpiercer Nobody's perfect, but some truly harrowing things come to light that make us look at Curtis Everett differently. Snowpiercer centers around the remaining groups of humanity who, due to Earth becoming largely frozen and inhospitable, are forced to live in a traveling train. A disturbing revelation follows when Curtis reveals what survivors did when times grew desperate years prior. Curtis killed the mother of his second-in-command, Edgar, and nearly resorted to cannibalism with Edgar himself to survive. That baby was Edgar. And I was the man with the knife. He ultimately didn't go through with it, and eventually the survivors were introduced to the protein blocks they now rely on for food. But this twist reveal is a horrifying reminder of the startling lengths Curtis went to in order to survive. 18 years I've waited for this moment. And now I'm here. Number 27. Vic is covering up the crime. Searching. She was assigned to the case, right? She was assigned. No, she definitely volunteered. What kind of lengths would you go to in order to protect your family? Detective Vic, for one, is ready to go to criminal lengths for her kid. In Searching, David Kim tries to find his teenage daughter Margot, who's gone missing. While he's aided by the police in this journey, it turns out some are keeping secrets. In fact, the person who was helping him, the aforementioned Detective Vic, was actually covering everything up since her son was the reason Margot disappeared. So your son calls you? asked you to help cover up a murder. No, no. It was my decision. David would later get his daughter back, but this just goes to show that not everyone can be trusted. Number 26. Tina and Vura are trolls. Border. When we first meet Tina, we're led to believe, much like she does, that she was born with a disability that gave her a Neanderthal-esque appearance. Then she meets Vura, a man with similar features, and the two develop a very curious friendship. instantly dubious of Vora, and our suspicions are confirmed when the two get intimate, though not in any way we've ever seen. Turns out neither one of them has disabilities, and that they're actually not even human at all but trolls, with Tina's real parents having been tortured by humans. Dear God. 
The twists don't stop there, as Vura has been orchestrating an abduction ring for years as a means of revenge. Trust us, we could not make this stuff up. Would you leave me alone? Yes, I let them. Number 25. Worry-Free is Breeding Equisapiens. Sorry to Bother You. Sorry to Bother You is a pretty weird movie, but nobody could predict just how weird it would actually get. The surreal, dark comedy is about Cassius Green, a black telemarketer who starts faking a white voice to get ahead at work. It's a roller coaster from there, but the craziest moment has to be when Cassius discovers the truth about mega corporation Worry Free. The company is making a wave of half human, half horse hybrids as the perfect employees. I just didn't want you to think I was crazy, that I was doing this for no reason, because this isn't irrational. Oh. Cool. You know, when they say a workplace is going hybrid, we don't think this is what they mean. Wanting to find opportunities for advancement at your job is great, but sometimes there's no shame in staying where you're at. That is the future of labor, okay? They're bigger, they're stronger, they hopefully gripe a lot less, and also, soon, I'm gonna have millions of them. Number 24. The Invisible Man wasn't just one person. The Invisible Man. When Cecilia Cass ends her relationship with her abusive engineer partner Adrian Griffin, she finds herself haunted by invisible forces at play. It turns out it's an actual Invisible Man who Cecilia suspects is Adrian despite him appearing to be dead. In an intense confrontation, Cecilia eventually kills the Invisible Man, and it's revealed to be Adrian's brother Tom. <gasps> Audiences expected it to be just Adrian. While it's been later confirmed that he was involved in the Invisible shenanigans, this moment proved that Tom definitely had some time spent in the suit too. Not to mention it exposed his sinister intentions since he tried harming Cecilia. Not cool, Tom. If he faked his own death, he could fake his own kidnapping. We have Tom's body laying in my living room, wearing some sort of suit that you shot to pieces. If it did work, it doesn't now. Number 23. Adrian Toomes is Liz's dad. Spider-Man Homecoming. Meeting the dad of the girl you like is never an easy thing to do. But what if the dad is actually the supervillain you've been battling against? Activating all systems. In Spider-Man Homecoming, it's up to Peter to stop Adrian Toomes, the criminal who operates as the Vulture. But when Peter goes to meet his homecoming date Liz, he discovers that Adrian is actually her father. He must be Peter. Yeah. I'm Liz's dad. Put her there. It's a moment that surprises all of us, but what makes it even more intense is the subsequent car ride. Yeah, that's right. Imagine being chauffeured by the person you need to defeat. It's safe to say that Peter probably doesn't make a very good first impression. Don't you ever, ever interfere with my business again. Because if you do, I'll kill you and everybody you love. Number 22. Harlan was given the right medicine. Knives out. If Marta was responsible for his death, even unintentionally, the Slayer rule would nullify the change will and you would get your share back. When Harlan Thromby is found dead the morning after his 85th birthday party, premier detective Benoit Blanc has to question his family to find the one responsible for his passing. Eventually, the truth comes out. The culprit? Harlan's grandson, Hugh. He poisoned Harlan by switching the medicine his nurse Marta gave him. When Harlan and Marta realized he was seemingly given the wrong substance and would die, he decided to take his own life first so she wouldn't get arrested. It's a surprise, but it's not the main twist. The real kicker is that Marta actually administered the right drug. You gave him the correct medication because you are a good nurse. If Harlan had just waited things out, he'd still be alive. While it's a grim reveal, at least justice ultimately prevailed. Number 21. It's set in present day. The Village. It simply isn't an M. Night Shyamalan movie without a twist. And the twist in The Village might just be one of his best ever. Mile 27, there's a girl. I'm gonna check it out. This movie is a period piece about a secluded village in the 1800s where the people are scared of creatures roaming the nearby woods. These creatures aren't actually real, and that's a cool twist on its own. But that's not what will blow your mind. 
it turns out this period piece movie isn't actually a period piece. It's really set in the modern day. You, you live in there? I do, sir. The village itself was founded by grief-stricken people who wanted to shield themselves from the dangers of present-day society. Let's just say this was definitely one way to do that. Number 20. Adelaide is the original red. Us. Appearances can be deceiving, especially when there's scores of red jumpsuit-clad doppelgangers slaughtering their lookalikes. Fortunately for the Wilson family, they're able to successfully fend off and kill their counterparts while the rest of the world burns and holds hands. They can't hurt you. You understand? It's only when they're out of harm's way that the Wilson matriarch Adelaide uncovers a long-repressed memory. Turns out that her childhood encounter with her doppelganger Red didn't end the way she thought. It was Red that left Adelaide in the underground to assume her life, meaning the Adelaide we've been following this whole time is not the original. This recontextualizes everything we've seen and adds another layer to an already thematically rich movie. Number 19. A cult is behind everything. Hereditary. There have been many horror movies that deal with potential insanity, but never one quite so effective as Hereditary. Upon noticing some strange goings-on, Annie begins to suspect a malevolent supernatural element at play. Only the more assured she becomes, the more unstable she seems as mental illness runs in her family. Mom, what are you doing? Or does it? Nope. Turns out the only thing that runs in her family is an affinity for demonic cults, as one led by her late mother orchestrated the seemingly accidental death of her daughter as a means of transferring the demon inside her into the body of her son. You are Paimon, one of the eight kings of hell. Yeah, this is one screwed up clan, and even more so now that their plan worked. Thanks for the nightmares, everyone. Number 18. The maid's husband is in the basement. Parasite. It's about halfway through the movie, the Kim family has successfully infiltrated the Park household and are now reveling in their newfound sense of outward affluence while the Parks are away. Right about now is when we're expecting the plot to take a turn and throw the Kims for a loop. So the twist isn't that it does, the twist is how it does, as the former maid that the Kims conspired to get fired returns to reveal her husband hiding out from debt collectors in the park's secret bunker, unbeknownst to everyone. <laughs> this not only introduces another level, literally, in Pong Joon-ho's biting social satire, but throws the entire second act into a state of bedlam we are not apt to forget. <laughs> Number 17. Amy faked her death. Gone Girl. Here's another twist that comes around the halfway mark. At this point, we've watched the likelihood that Nick killed his wife swell and swell with each piece of evidence found, to the point that even we're suspicious of him. So imagine our surprise when Amy seemingly narrates from beyond the grave, only to learn, nope, she's alive and well, on the run, incognito, and ready to let her husband take the fall for a murder that never happened. Sure, Nick was an unfaithful jackass, but even we were flabbergasted at the lengths of Amy's duplicity and spitefulness. You know the old expression, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned? Yeah, we're pretty sure whoever wrote that was talking about Amy. And if I get everything right, the world will hate Nick for killing his beautiful pregnant wife. Number 16. The kidnapping was faked. Gone baby gone. Much like protagonist Patrick Kenzie, we want nothing more than the locating and safeguarding of kidnapped Amanda McCready. Upon following Patrick down a series of fake leads, we're led to believe that Amanda was accidentally killed during an exchange between the police and the criminals who purportedly took her. I know, something went in the water. What? You heard something? Yeah, something went in. Where did it go? There. Our hearts were broken, only to learn that she's still alive and well in the protection of police captain Jack Doyle, who orchestrated this scheme to get Amanda out of the hands of her neglectful mother. We're just trying to give a little girl a life. Wasn't your life to give. Finally, it looks like we might get some semblance of a happy ending, but Patrick can't walk away, reporting Doyle and sending Amanda back into squalor, 
breaking our hearts all over again. Once an icon of justice and a model for crusaders, Jack Doyle is behind bars tonight. Number 15. The Armitage family is inhabiting black people. Get out. You've heard this story a thousand times. White girl has a black boyfriend, white girl takes black boyfriend home to meet white family, and white family performs involuntary neurosurgery on black boyfriend to put their consciousnesses into his body. Wait, what? This bitch is crazy. This bitch is crazy. While that may be a total meme or cliche now, in 2017 it was absolutely gobsmacking. Sure, we knew something was off, what with the hypno tea, creepy groundskeeper, and bingo auction, but we never could have guessed this is what was going on. Shit. Or that Chris's girlfriend was in on it. Even when looking back, there were so many signs proving that between this and us, Jordan Peele is truly a new master of suspense. And who knows? Maybe one day you'll enjoy being members of the family. Number 14. Snape was a good guy all along. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. Don't tell me now that you've grown to care for the point. There might not be anybody in the Harry Potter franchise who toes the line between good and evil more than Severus Snape. To be fair, a name like that doesn't exactly scream sunshines and rainbows anyway. He may have been a devious character at times, but the eighth Harry Potter film proved that he was a force for good in the end. While he joined up with the Death Eaters, memory sequences revealed that he was infiltrating Voldemort's ranks to take him down and ensure Harry would triumph. You have your mother's eyes. This was his way of avenging Lily Potter. After all, he never truly stopped loving her. The Dark Lord killed him, but in the end, Snape died with honor. Number 13. The characters are personalities. Identity. Over the course of the film, we're led to believe that detained serial killer Malcolm Rivers, who has dissociative personality disorder, is going to figure into the events with the main cast at the motel somehow, either through flashbacks or alternating timelines. And he does figure into it, or should we say they figure into him, because not only does the motel not exist, but every inhabitant of it trying to stay alive is each of Malcolm's personalities jockeying for positioning inside his brain. Why are you telling me this? Because you, Edward, are one of his personalities. While still a whodunit with victims being taken out one by one, the plot suddenly takes on a whole new meaning as the stakes are somehow raised, while now technically operating at a psychological and neurological level. One of the personalities you've met tonight, Edward, committed those murders four years ago. Number 12. Esther is an adult. Orphan. Between the bad seed and the good son, we've gotten no shortage of evil children in horror movies, so we thought we knew what to expect with Orphan. Sure, the poster's tagline famously says there's something wrong with Esther, and we had no doubt there was. Obviously, there has to be some other explanation. She didn't come from an insane asylum. How do you know that? The orphanage you thought she came from has never heard of her. Only, we didn't think that thing would be that this ostensible adoptee from hell was actually a 33-year-old woman with a hormone disorder that gives her a childlike appearance. She has a rare hormone disorder. It's called hypopituitarism. It causes proportional dwarfism. She only looks like a child. According to our records, Lena Klammer was born in 1976. She's 33 years old. Up until the reveal, Orphan was just your typical psychological horror film. But then, it suddenly became incredibly unnerving and disturbing in equal measure. Evil kids we can deal with. Evil adults posing as evil kids we cannot. <laughs> Number 11. Half of Life is Killed. Avengers Infinity War. While Marvel had been breaking new ground for 10 years by the time it came to release this, their 19th film in their cinematic universe, we were still comfortable with the notion that the good guys win and the bad guys lose. Of course, we knew another Avengers film would come out a year later to wrap up the story, but we still didn't anticipate our favorite heroes to lose on such a monumental scale. You should have gone for the head. <laughs> Not only does Thanos triumph, but he makes good on the promise he made in the beginning of the movie by wiping out half of all life in the universe. You're all right. I don't, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. Sure, we knew he was capable, but never in a million years did we think Marvel would go through with it. Sorry.
Number 10. Mr. Glass is a supervillain, unbreakable. They say this one has a surprise ending. Even by the time M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable hit theaters, audiences were clued into the probability of there being a twist due to the shocking nature of the Sixth Sense's revelation a year prior. Yet even with that expectation, he was able to surprise us. When indestructible man David Dunn survives a train crash with nary a scratch, he's indoctrinated into the larger superhero mythology by the brittle-boned Elijah Price. I believe comics are a form of history that someone somewhere felt or experienced. Though it would seem an unconventional friendship is forming, Elijah takes on the moniker Mr. Glass when it's revealed he caused David's train to crash to begin with, willing to kill hundreds of people just to find a superhero counterpart to his supervillain persona. If that's not a diabolical scheme, we don't know what is. They called me Mr. Glass. Number 9. The Happy Ending Was a Lie – Atonement Set around World War II, Atonement is aptly named due to the mistake young Bryony makes in falsely accusing her sister Cecilia's lover Robbie of assault. After Robbie is imprisoned and subsequently forced to fight, an older Bryony finally gets the chance to apologize to an eventually reunited Cecilia and Robbie upon realizing her mistake. I'm very, very sorry for the terrible distress that I've caused. Or does she? As an elderly Bryony explains, this scene in her book depicting the events was merely imaginary, as both Cecilia and Robbie were killed separately in the war, never having gotten their happy ending. I was too much of a coward to go and see my sister in June 1940. I never made that journey to Valley. To have both characters go through so much only to have their love squandered over a simple misunderstanding is heartbreaking, and we're still not over it. My sister and Robbie were never able to have the time together. They both so longed for and deserved. Number 8. Teddy is Andrew Latus, Shutter Island. There are a lot of mysteries in Shutter Island's mental health hospital for the criminally insane for duly appointed Federal Marshal Teddy Daniels to uncover. Where is Andrew Latus, the killer of Teddy's wife? What is the law of four? Who is patient 67? It turns out the answer to both questions is Teddy whose entire investigation is actually the staff's elaborate play to get Teddy, for latest, to realize his own breakdown and repression. You've been here for two years, a patient of this institution. We were about as floored by this revelation as Teddy, who, depending on your interpretation of the final line, may have repressed it all over again. Or did he? Kudos to the movie for being able to deliver a wallop of a twist and leave a little up to interpretation. Which would be worse? To live as a monster, or to die as a good man. Number 7. Nonlinear Time Arrival. Arrival begins with the daughter of linguist Louise Banks dying of disease. You come back to me. When alien pods land on Earth and attempt to communicate, an interspecies war is looming, and time is of the essence. Or is it? Banks struggles to decipher the cyclical nature of the alien language, only to realize that unlocking it is to see time from a non-linear perspective. So, so you can see what's to come. But time, it, it isn't the same for them. It's non-linear. As she does both, she's able to communicate with her future self and figure out how to create an armistice. Along with this, we learn that Banks' daughter exists not in the past, but in the future, and that Banks will have her with the knowledge that she will die young and choose the opportunity to love anyway. Mind blown. Despite knowing the journey and where it leads, I embrace it. Number six, the family is already dead, The Others. Gosh, it's so hard to tell a novel haunted house story these days, but The Others managed to flip the script in a way that was both cathartic and unexpected. It follows Grace and her two children in the aftermath of World War II, who begin to suspect their house is haunted by ghosts when objects move on their own and a strange elderly woman appears. That's the number of times I've seen them. I've seen the old woman the most. It turns out Grace was right. There are ghosts in the house. Them. We know the woman went mad, smothered her two children, and then shot herself. What they perceive to be ghosts are actually the living inhabitants of the home, and the elderly woman, a medium looking to expunge them. No one can make us leave this house. Number five, the military arrives, the mist. By the time we reach the end of the mist, our characters have been put through the proverbial ringer by a whole slew of interdimensional creatures. After escaping the grocery store in search of rescue, our five remaining survivors are left helpless when their car runs out of gas. With monstrous sounds closing in, main protagonist David Drayton opts to spare the other passengers an agonizing death by shooting each of them. There's five of us. 
One bullet short, he exits the vehicle to meet his fate, only to realize the sounds were that of the military gaining control of the situation. As he's rescued, he realizes he killed the others, including his own son, for nothing. Jeez, what a gut punch. <laughs> Number 4. Duplicates – The Prestige In this film of dueling magicians, there are no lengths one wouldn't go to undermine the other. Both are ingenious with a trick up their sleeve, though one is decidedly more complex than the other. When Hugh Jackman's Angier drowns to death, Christian Bale's Borden is framed for murder and executed for it. However, Angier is still alive – well, one of them anyway – as he found a way to clone himself each show before drowning in a pool. Just when Angier thinks he's won, it's revealed that Borden is still alive too – well, one of them, as Borden was an identity shared by two identical twins to assist in tricks. Were you the one who went into the box, or the one who came back out? We took turns. Borden gets his revenge, and we get two twists for the price of one. She sacrificed Robert. That's the price of a good trick. Number 3. The Dead Body is Jigsaw – Saw As the Saw movies progressed while regressing in quality, it became almost an obligatory cliché that they'd all have a twist ending. But that was only because the twist in the first movie was so good. After seemingly surviving Jigsaw's game by killing their captor Zepp, a freed but hemorrhaging Dr. Gordon crawls away to get a chained Adam help. Thinking he's safe, Adam catches his breath while the seemingly dead body that's been on the floor for hours suddenly starts to rise. Our jaws drop along with Adam's when we realize that Zepp was just an involuntary pawn for the real Jigsaw, who was mere feet away the whole time. Adam screams in terror as Jigsaw slams the door shut, leaving him to die. Game over. <laughs> Number 2. Leonard Killed His Wife – Memento Leonard Shelby is a man with anterograde amnesia, unable to create new memories. Looking to avenge the death of his wife when the two of them were assaulted, Leonard resorts to leaving clues for himself in the form of Polaroids and tattoos to aid in his investigation. From here, Memento is unique in that many of the scenes play reverse chronologically, and we are allowed to uncover what got us here to begin with. We found him, you killed him. But you didn't remember. Much like Shutter Island, Leonard learns that his wife survived their attack and was killed later when Leonard accidentally gave her too much of her medication, having forgotten he already gave it to her. Sammy didn't have a wife. It was your wife who had diabetes. Doomed to forget again, Leonard will continue to repress his mistake forevermore. Do I lie to myself to be happy? In your case, Teddy. Yes, I will. So many of these movies are watch again immediately after to make sure you caught everything movies, you know what I mean? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Mido is Odesu's daughter, Old Boy. After being kidnapped and imprisoned for 15 years, Odesu is suddenly released without explanation. Incensed, he sets off on a revenge mission to uncover who kidnapped him to begin with and track down his long-lost daughter. Along his journey, he's aided and tended to by the young Mido, with whom he falls in love and sleeps with. A whole lot of octopus eating and ass kicking later, Desu identifies the villain as an old classmate of his, Li Wu Jin. The latter's sister took her life when Desu publicized that the siblings were engaged in inappropriate behavior. Wu Jin reveals his elaborate revenge scheme, which included Desu's relationship with Mido, who is actually his daughter. Horrified by the truth, Desu takes extreme measures. What do you think are some of the best movie plot twists? Surprise us in the comments. <laughs> After all this time, always. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.